I landed in Canada, a refugee from unemployment and want in England, with the youthful, naive idea of finding work and prosperity in the new country. It soon became apparent that here also there were no jobs, and for a couple of days, I hung around the CPR depot, dozing on benches. Canada will become Ronald Liversedge's home, but for the next 10 years, he will have no fixed address. I'm going down the road feeling bad. I'm going down the road feeling bad. I'm going down the road feeling bad, Lord, Lord. And I ain't going to be treated this way. I learned of the life of the transient unemployed. I learned of freight riding, of being hounded by police from town to town. My kids need three square meals a day, Lord, Lord, and I ain't gonna be treated this way. We were not professional hobos, but unemployed men, many recent immigrants, the beginning of a mighty army. Liversedge will become a foot soldier in that army. The suffering he sees in Canada will lead him and many others to radical solutions. Canada is between two wars, but it is not at peace. There are personal tragedies on every corner. Riots in the street. Revolution in the air. The old guard has no solutions, but the extremists have many. The country is in chaos. Poets, painters, farmers, and factory girls. The depression will remain with them all forever. Irene Duhamel's family is not well off, but she and her 14 brothers and sisters know that if they work hard, their fortunes will soon change. I slept with two sisters and one of the babies in the same bed. We slept across the bed so there would be more room. There were so many of us that the bed was warm when those who worked nights took over from those who worked days. It is Wednesday afternoon, and Irene Duhamel is on her way to class. She will spend her last few moments as a student in the principal's office. I was surprised because I was summoned to go home. It was so I could go to work. I just thought this isn't possible. It can't be true.
Irene Duhamel's father cobbled together the money to send his daughter to school by working double shifts at the local pulp mill. In the 1920s, two-thirds of the world's news was printed on Canadian paper. It was boom time. Canada's natural resources were in demand everywhere. In 1929, European currencies plummet. The U.S. stock market crashes, and the market for Canadian goods dries up. One-third of Quebec pulp workers lose their jobs. And Irene Duhamel must support her family. I planned to be a nurse when I grew up. My best friend and I were going to enroll together. But now it was my turn to help out the younger kids in the family. There were 15 mouths to feed and we needed my salary. My heart was heavy. I cried so many tears. I cried enough for the rest of my life. Thousands of miles away, Canada's boom produced nearly half the wheat sold worldwide. And in Saskatchewan, a young newlywed prepares for a bountiful harvest. I loved every minute, especially when I was allowed to haul the wheat to the elevator. It was worth working and waiting for all summer. And the order to Eaton's for clothing? Well, that was the most exciting of all. But Anne Bailey will go 10 years without a new dress. The price of wheat is sinking. It will go from a dollar a bushel to 34 cents. Anne Bailey's husband has to leave her in order to feed the family. I have the dubious honor of belonging to the 43% of farm wives who've kept things going while the boss was elsewhere, working for some cash to improve the farm. The depression has crippled their farm. But it is the drought that follows in 1930 that destroys it. Family by family, thousands of Canadians are being ruined by economic disaster. But the Prime Minister of Canada appears to be oblivious. William Lyon Mackenzie King flatly refuses to help provinces run by his opponents. With respect to giving money to any Tory government in this country, with policies diametrically opposed to this government, I would not give them a five cent piece. Voters find King's attitude so callous in the midst of a crisis that they replace him. The new Prime Minister, R.B. Bennett, is a tough-talking millionaire. With his business experience, he believes he can restore Canada's shattered economy. The Conservative Party is going to find work for all who are willing to work or perish in the attempt. Why don't you work like the other men do? Well, how can I work when there's no work to do. Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah, give us a hand out to revive. 
of us again. The depression has spread to the cities where young single men can no longer find jobs. Nearly 100,000 men jump aboard trains, crisscrossing the country in search of work. When they get off the trains, they are arrested for not having a job. The official term is vagrancy. Springtime has come. I'm just out of jail. I ain't got no money. It's all gone for bail. Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah gives a hand out to revive us again. Ronald Liversedge has just served 30 days for vagrancy in a Sudbury jail. The scene at one filthy soup kitchen fuels his mounting sense of outrage. The atmosphere was like that in a chilly, moldy crypt. The tables were covered with ice and beans and pieces of wet bread. The meals were always the same. The exception was the shooting of a bear by a Sudbury businessman who gave the bear to the city, who then sent it to the soup kitchen, with the result that a few hundred men suffered violent diarrhoea. I went to a house, I asked for some bread. The lady said, scram bum, the baker is dead. Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah, give us a hand out to revive us again. James Gray has achieved the middle class dream. By the time he is in his late teens, he has a wife, a daughter, and a brand new mini golf course, the latest fad. Until it goes bust. My number came up and I was confronted with the ego-shattering discovery that there wasn't a single employer in all Winnipeg who would give me a job. It was my own fault. Couldn't feed my family. Although 25% of the population is unemployed, R.B. Bennett is still talking like a businessman. Never will I, or any government of which I am part, put a premium on idleness. As the crisis hits the middle class, it takes a psychological toll. Though most people still have jobs, everyone is fearful, even R.B. Bennett. He agrees to hand the provinces $20 million for relief. Among the first Canadians to go on the dole is James Gray. We received no cash. Vouchers covered food and fuel and rent. But we needed other things, many other things. Like tobacco and cigarette papers, toothpaste, razor blades, lipstick, face powder, the odd bottle of aspirin, streetcar fare. We could have cleaned our teeth with soap, but there was such a thing as morale, even for the destitute. Their food ration runs out halfway through every month. James Gray stands in line to see the one doctor assigned to the 16,000 people on the dole in Winnipeg. It must have been quite some time since he had encountered such a walking skeleton. I was 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighed 118 pounds with most of my clothes on. I got the bad news. The doctor was completely offhand about it. 
James Gray is one of nearly 100,000 Canadians diagnosed with tuberculosis during the Depression. Canada is beginning her descent into chaos, and she need only look to her eastern shore to see how desperate things can become. In 1932, 10,000 rioters storm the House of Assembly in the Dominion of Newfoundland. They are calling for the head of the Prime Minister, Richard Squires. He survives when a fledgling politician named Joey Smallwood dresses him in a monk's uniform and spirits him out of town. The island nation is desperately poor, yet their prime minister seems mysteriously wealthy. Newfoundland is now facing bankruptcy and default on millions of dollars of debt. Britain sends a commissioner to investigate. There has been a terrible misgovernment. Worse, terrible immorality in the government. The people have been exploited. And yet they are a fine people, really. And if they get a decent government, they will do well. Though the place is an appalling mess. Britain agrees to assume responsibility for Newfoundland's staggering debt, if Newfoundland agrees to Britain's terms. The country must return to the status of colony, run by an unelected committee appointed by Britain. With few options, the people of Newfoundland vote to end their independence. Canadians wonder if their own democracy will survive. As the old order lies dying, a new generation is trying to overturn the remaining taboos. They believe that sex, race, politics and art are all ripe for radical change. Jazz is a little avant-garde, a little dangerous, and thriving in Montreal. Saxophone player Myron Sutton moves from Ontario to the center of the action. The Toronto Club is the kind of place where anything could happen. But I saw that Puff Jaws, Dizzy Gillespie come in there. Duke Ellington came in and sat behind the bar. While most North American clubs are segregated, in Montreal, integration continues late into the evening. You have to give a French Canadian white woman all the credit in the world because she was the nicest woman to all the black musicians. If it wasn't for the French Canadian women, all the black musicians who came from anywhere and stayed would have starved to death. From speakeasies to seminaries, the Depression is an opportunity to challenge convention. Georges-Henri Lévesque is a Catholic scholar who pushes his Laval University students to look beyond the Bible for social and economic solutions. These young people, already full of worry, if not misery, are often full of talents, of energy, and of devotion. So they are often attracted 
to revolts. But what they want more than anything is to live fully, to be all that they should be. Young artists begin to reject traditional landscapes. The country is in crisis, and it is their job to paint it. If man's liberation is the chief aim of action, the function of the creator is as essential as that of the politician or the economist. Eighteen-year-old Marion Dale grew up in a proper Westmount home, but she throws all that aside to become an artist. She finds a soulmate in Frank Scott, a legal scholar and poet. While we were dancing, I said some foolish thing, and he looked down at me and smiled his smile, and I knew that I would like him. They believe romantic freedom is essential to creativity. Fidelity is fine for their parents. We believed in forward things. We thought we should allow each other to be free, and we would be honest with each other and say if we found somebody else, we wouldn't want to continue. Frank Scott's poem captures the hope and foreboding of the times. How shall I hear old music? This is an hour of new beginnings, concepts warring for power, decay of systems. The tissue of art is torn, with overtures of an era being born. Russia is half a world away. But Joseph Stalin is one of the most feared men in Canada. Canada's Prime Minister R.B. Bennett is terrified of communist revolution on Canadian soil. We know that throughout Canada, this propaganda is being put forward by organizations from foreign lands that seek to destroy our institutions. And we ask that every man and woman put the iron heel of ruthlessness against a thing of that kind. Bennett does not have to look very far to find evidence for his fears. The Times of London reports that Moscow has sent operatives to Canada to organize mine workers. And in Blairmore, Alberta, 200 miles south of Calgary, Canada gets its first communist town. The mayor is a businessman named Bill Knight. Back in 1929, there were no reds. Things were prosperous. Everyone was well fed. It is different today. You talk about communists. The communists in Canada were made by Bennett. Bennett's chief military advisor, General Andrew McNaughton, warns him that the unemployed could launch a revolution on Canadian soil. In the ragged platoons are the prospective members of what Marx called the Industrial Reserve Army, the stormtroopers of the revolution. His solution? To warehouse at least 10,000 unemployed men far from the cities where they are stirring up dissent. They will go to camps in the wilderness, 
under military authority. The men are paid 20 cents a day, about a tenth of what a working man makes for the same job. To prevent even talk of communist revolution, Bennett enforces Section 98 of the Criminal Code, which allows the authorities to lock up dissidents. The Prime Minister believes that immigrants, especially those from Eastern Europe, are responsible for bringing communism to Canada. We will take action as will free this country from those who have proven themselves unworthy of Canadian citizenship. Foreign-born Canadians are forced from their homes by police, often in the middle of the night. Nearly 30,000 Canadians are deported without any right of appeal. Edward Reinkinen, born in Finland, deported in 1931 after attending a demonstration. Sophie Scheinen, born in Russia, involved in illegal assembly, deported November 1932. Hans Kist, born in Germany, married, labor organizer, deported in 1932, died after being tortured in a Nazi concentration camp. While Bennett is deporting suspected socialists from Canada, Fascists are marching across Europe. But R.B. Bennett is not as concerned about the threat of Nazism. There is no move to curb the growing popularity of men like William Whitaker, the head of Winnipeg's Nazi party. Joe Farr, leader of Ontario's fascists. Or Adrien Arcan, an unemployed journalist in Montreal who Hitler eventually appoints as his Canadian representative. Jews are like cockroaches and bugs. Don't be fooled. There are many around. It is too bad we cannot exterminate them with insecticides. Adrian Arcan's anti-Semitism does not disqualify him from working for the federal Tories. He is appointed to recruit new members for the party. Extremists are fighting for the souls of Canadians in the middle. But Bennett feels no threat from the fascists and believes he has suppressed the communists. He is unaware of the revolution being planned in the labor camps he has created. Ronald Liversedge came to Canada to seek his fortune, but ends up in a British Columbia work camp, plotting the downfall of the capitalist system. We used the camps as schools. In those bunkhouses, there were more men reading Marx, Lenin and Stalin than there were reading girly magazines. The Tory government of R.B. Bennett had decided a role for the single unemployed. They were to be hidden away to become forgotten men, the forgotten generation. How naive of Mr. Bennett. The army of the unemployed is mobilizing to attack R.B. Bennett and change the way Canada treats its poor. Depuis que tard, c'était 
rien, on se plaît du gouvernement, on nous promet plus peu que de fait avec ça, on avance à bien nos députés, sont assemblés afin de pouvoir discuter, alors au lieu de nous aider, ils ne font que se chamoyer. Mais dans tout ça, les plus affreux, ce sont les chefs qui malheureux, pas d'argent pour les faire soigner, au fait ni par les enterrer, ça arrive tout à fait, The department store heir, John David Eaton, is one of the few who sees the bright side of the Depression. Nobody thought about money in those days because they never saw any. You could take your girl to a supper dance at the hotel for $10, and that included the bottle and a room for you and your friends to drink it in. It was a good time for everybody. People learned what it was like to work. Fifteen-year-old Irene Duhamel is learning what it's like to work. She has a job in a factory that supplies the thread that sews the dresses sold by department stores like Eaton's. Because I was small, I had to climb into the needles and go between the threads with a little brush to lift the cotton debris. My hands were full of blood. It got as hot as 105 degrees. The company hired a nurse to give us salt pills if we fainted. With a million people ready to take their jobs, workers will risk their lives for a paycheck. Because of the heat, many employees got sick, especially with tuberculosis. One of my friends got sick and died. After my friend died, the boss came to pay his respects. We were inside with the mother. When he came to the door, she screamed, You killed my daughter. You killed my daughter. We had to hold her back. Workers like Duhamel find an unlikely champion. In 1934, Bennett's popular labor minister, H. H. Stevens, wages war on big business. The law has holes big enough for millionaires to crawl through, and company laws that permit the fleecing of the public on one hand and the sweatshops on the other. Under Stevens' direction, a panel of MPs interviews workers across the country. An Eaton sewer tells them she is paid nine and a half cents for a dress that Eaton sells for a dollar sixty-nine. You were badgered, harassed, and worried. You were told to work and work and work so hard at these cheaper rates, and you were threatened if you didn't, you would be fired. You had no time to get up and have a drink of water. You just went on working. Hit hard by bad press, Eaton's reforms its labor practices. But their suppliers continue as they always have, and life doesn't change one iota for Irene Duhamel.
As if economic disaster is not enough, the prairie is on the verge of becoming a desert. Some children born during the drought will not see their first drop of rain until decades end. They eat what their parents can shoot when there is money for bullets. Thousands of farmers have no choice but to leave their homes behind. Much of the prairie is left abandoned. But Anne Bailey's family has worked the land for generations and she has no plans to budge until the day she finds herself alone with her children and helpless against nature's wrath. My son came running into the house, greatly excited. Come quick, Mum, he shouted. There's a big black cloud coming in the sky. He ran out ahead of me and pointed to the western sky where, sure enough, there was the blackest, most terrifying-looking cloud I have ever seen. very quickly, and the edge of it was rolling along. Panic rose in me. What should I do? Where should we go? The house was sure to be blown away, and our nearest neighbor was a mile away. At the rate the cloud was moving, I could never make it, as I would have to carry the baby. I shut the door tight picked up the baby, and yelling at the other two to follow, I ran for the dugout barn. Already the shadow of the cloud was upon us. It was light enough for me to see the forms of the cattle. I knew it was safe to open the door. So once again, I looked outside. Everything, land, air, sky, was a dull gray color. feet sank in sand, and we breathed and tasted sand. Such a mess. Canadians are overwhelmed by forces beyond their control, and there is only one man to turn to. Murray Harbor, PEI. Dear Sir, I am writing to see if there is any help I could get, as I have a baby 13 days old that only weighs one pound, and I have to keep in cotton wool and olive oil, and I haven't the money to buy it. If there is any help I could get, there will be two votes for you next election. 
Hoping to hear from you soon. Yours truly, Mrs. Jack O'Hannon. Her letter to the Prime Minister is Mrs. Jack O'Hannon's last hope. When he receives it, Bennett opens his wallet and sends the young mother five dollars, enough money to cover groceries for about a month. Bennett has failed to come up with any far-reaching policy to alleviate the suffering caused by the Depression. It seems all he can do is try to help those individuals who write to him. Alone in his 17-room suite at the Chateau Laurier Hotel in Ottawa, Bennett works through the night, trying to keep up with an endless chorus of heartbreak and despair. Toronto. Dear Mr. Bennett, I believe you to be a good as well as a great man. Therefore, I am appealing to you to save my home. Picture yourself, through no fault of your own, homeless with sons willing but unable to provide for you. Please help me or tell me what I can do. Yours sincerely and hopefully, Laura Bates. Dear Madam, I am certainly willing to help you, and if you will be good enough to let me know what company holds the mortgage on your home, I will look into the matter and see if anything can be done to straighten out your difficulties. Yours faithfully, R.B. Bennett. Weedon Station, Quebec. Dear Sir, please excuse me for asking for your help, as I have no other option. I have been sick for five years. I have six young children, I am 42 years old, and I have no money, no more food, and we are without clothing, and all we can think about, my dear R.B. Bennett, is the cold winter ahead. Please believe me, I remain your devoted Philemon Patry. Wellesley, Ontario. Dear Sir, three little baby boys were born to Mr. and Mrs. Samuels in our vicinity. Like many others, they have had some very bad luck. The parents are a very fine type, not the kind with a handout for help. We hope you will feel toward these unfortunate people the way we do. Yours truly, Elizabeth Rattray. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Samuels, I am enclosing herewith a $20 bill, which I trust may be of some little service to you during the Christmas season. I learned the other day that one of the triplet boys had passed away, and I extend to you my sincerest sympathy. With best wishes, believe me, I am yours faithfully, R.B. Bennett. Kingdom, Saskatchewan. Dear Prime Minister R.B. Bennett, it is with a very humble heart that I take the opportunity of writing this letter to ask you if you will please send for this underwear for my husband from the Eaton catalog. I can manage, but my husband has arthritis very bad. Dear Sir, received your kind favor of underwear for my husband. We wish to thank you very much for it. We sure are thankful for your kindness. Mr. Dear Mr. Bennett, I am a little boy, eight years old, and I'm in grade three at school. I've wanted a little red wagon to hitch my dog to. Dear Mr. So Bennett, years, thank you very much for the money. I'm going to get the wagon. Mama said I could. Dear Mr. Bennett, you're a very good friend. Hurry, I can't spell very good to write. I think my woman is coming to see me this summer. I didn't see her for four years, and I have no clothes. Have you some old clothes you could send me? And I will do a good turn for you. Yours truly. Mickey Rattel. Right soon. Sir, this is from a mother whose son is wandering somewhere in Ontario trying vainly to get work. What are you going to do for these thousands of young men? 
There is lots of work to be done if you would only start them at it. You have never had to sleep out in the snow and rain or go days without food. Just stop and think of these hungry boys when you are at your next banquet. You have no children, so you cannot realize how parents feel with their sons wandering in this useless search for work. You have only a short time now to try and help these men, or it will be up to the other party to do it. A mother. In 1933, U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt introduces a revolutionary New Deal. His government pays for new highways, dams, railways, parks, and public art, and America is on its way back to work. Even R.B. Bennett is impressed. And on the last day of 1934, Canadians turn on their radios to hear an astonishing change of heart from their Prime Minister. The old order is gone. Canada, on the dole, is like a young and vigorous man in the poorhouse. The dole is a condemnation final and complete of our economic system. If we cannot abolish the dole, we should abolish the system. I am for reform. Bennett has a good speech, but his words lead to few concrete results, and Canada never gets its new deal. Canada remains on the dole. And while Bennett is retreating from his promises, the men in the labor camps are advancing. One thousand five hundred relief camp workers in BC struck their camps and moved into Vancouver in an attempt to gain an audience for their particular complaints and to coerce the national government into developing a work and wages program. Ronald Liversetch joins the protest and submits to military-style discipline. The young men have been penned in for months, but are ordered to refrain from drinking, smoking, and flirting. They plan to occupy Vancouver until they are given real jobs. And when they ask for money, it seems Vancouver is on their side. It was a happy day, like a gala occasion. Vancouver was with us to the tune of $4,600. The mothers of Vancouver hold a lunch to raise money for the strikers. 20,000 people attend. It is a signal to the Prime Minister that it is time to take care of Canada's poor. But the Prime Minister is blind to the message. These are several well-known communistic societies. We have declined to enter into any discussion with them. The army of the unemployed moves towards Ottawa, an angry but disciplined column prepared to take on the Prime Minister in person. Thousands of men jump aboard trains, taking as their anthem an old Union song. We meet today in freedom's cause and raise our voices high. We'll join our hands in you strong to battle or to die. Hold the fort for we are coming union men be strong. Side by side we battle onward. Victory will come. 
The train crews were cooperating with us in every possible way, and there was yet no attempt made to stop our march to the east. It seemed as though local and provincial authorities were leaving it to the federal government. And in the meantime, we were quite a formidable force and beginning to snowball. See our numbers still increasing, hear the bugle blow. By our union we shall triumph over every foe. Hold the fort, for we are coming, union men be strong. Side by side we battle onward, victory. The momentum seems unstoppable. Everywhere they go, they pick up hundreds more recruits. But they never make it past Regina. Bennett forbids the railways to take the men further. He has the exits to the city sealed. The marchers are trapped. On July 1st, they meet to determine their next move. They are closely monitored by the RCMP, who take their orders from Bennett. A shrill whistle blasted out a signal. The backs of vans were opened, and out poured the mounties, each armed with a baseball bat. In less than four minutes, Market Square was a mass of writhing, groaning forms, like a battlefield. Forty-five people are injured. A policeman is killed. It is the worst riot in over a decade, and the timing could not be worse for R.B. Bennett. He is at the end of his term, and now he must call an election. His opponent, Mackenzie King, knows which note to strike. He offers Canadians King or Chaos, and in October of 1935, they pick King. Bennett has run the country for five of its darkest, most turbulent years. He has done his best, but the times demand much more. Angry and disillusioned, R.B. Bennett eventually leaves Canada and moves to England forever. Three people come to say goodbye. Now Mackenzie King has inherited the economic crisis and an even greater challenge. For Canada has only begun to witness the forces of extremism that will soon send the world into war. It is 1935, and the only thing millions of Canadians care about is getting a job. They have lost their homes, their families, and their pride. Few anticipate that things could get worse. But when the Great Depression finally ends, it is at a terrible cost. Mackenzie King has just been re-elected Prime Minister of Canada. There is a seance to celebrate his victory. His parents send congratulations from the grave. His father offers a prediction. The fate of Canada is in your hands. The fate of Great Britain depends on Canada. The fate of Europe 
depends on Great Britain. King's father may be a ghost, but he is an astute ghost. By decade's end, Canada will be thrust to the forefront of the century's great showdown. For five years, Canada has been mired in economic gloom, but a fresh crop of politicians promises better times ahead. The new Premier of Quebec, Maurice Duplessis, holds court in the Chateau Frontenac Hotel in Quebec City. Life in the province is about to get better for his supporters. Do you want a new hospital? Do you want a new bridge? Electric light bulbs, a new school? Then vote Union Nationale. In Alberta, William Aberhart is a preacher who uses the power of radio to push his new political party, Social Credit. He promises Albertans $25 a month. It was not long ago I picked up my paper and found someone reporting that social credit is a harebrained scheme. I said, thank goodness I haven't got any hair. Aberhart loses no time installing his family at Edmonton's elegant Hotel McDonald. In Ontario, Premier Mitchell Hepburn preaches solidarity with the man in the street while governing from a hotel suite far above the fray. A reporter describes life at the top. Mitchell Hepburn led me into the room where the radio was playing and introduced me to his friends. They were his doctor and a member of his government and two attractive girls who sprawled on the sofa and called the prime minister chief. William Lyon Mackenzie King lives with his dog Pat in a quiet house on a quiet street. They spend most evenings sipping Ovaltine and eating cookies until King's doctor tells them they are both getting too fat. King often confers with the great beyond. Here too, moderation is advised. Go to bed early whenever you can. Eat lightly. Drink no spirits or wine. Try to pray all you can. In the heavens and on earth, King is a man who values prudence above all other virtues. The more I talk, the less clear my judgment. I avoid pitfalls by being careful to exercise judgment and caution. King will stay true to his words, taking his message of caution as far as the Third Reich. If it is caution that Mackenzie King wants, he has chosen the wrong woman. Corrine Wilson is one of Ottawa's leading hostesses. She is better known for her lavish fundraisers than her political convictions.
She is more shocked than anyone when Mackenzie King appoints her as Canada's first female senator. The press supports King's choice. Mrs. Wilson is the very antithesis of the short-haired woman reformer, is the exact opposite of that unlovely female type which talks of Freud and complexes and the latest novel and poses as being intellectual. She is of the much more appealing and competent kind who make a success of their job of taking care of a home. But Wilson is more concerned about foreign conflicts than domestic arts. She is about to become one of Canada's leading voices against fascism. By the early 1930s, Wilson is concerned that Japan's recent invasion of Manchuria, Mussolini's tyranny in Italy, and Hitler's stranglehold on Germany pose a threat to all democracies. Nobody can be true to ideals of religion, liberty and democratic principles and exist under a Nazi or fascist regime. Without a belief in the dignity of man, without indignation against arbitrarily created human suffering, there can be no democratic principles. Corrine Wilson believes democratic nations must stand together to confront dictators. Two years into her term, Wilson's fellow senators consider withdrawing Canada from the League of Nations. When Wilson protests, they tell her not to become exercised over faraway conflicts. Wilson is nervous but cannot remain silent. She finds courage in the paintings of the Great War that cover the Senate walls. Those whose memories we especially cherish did not make their sacrifices in vain. They will prevail over those whose views would tend to perpetuate the horrors of war. Even though some of these latter may be seated in high places of legislative power. But Mackenzie King is also haunted by the Great War. Nearly 20 years before, Canadians were bitterly divided when conscription was imposed. Nothing scares him more than the possibility of another foreign conflict. We shall have the old war situation over again, with the party divided as it was at the time of conscription. Italy brazenly invades Ethiopia in 1935. Kareen Wilson urges Mackenzie King to join the vote to punish Mussolini at the League of Nations. But King informs Wilson he will not support any punishment of Italy. It is a complete sacrifice of Ethiopia to Italy as a means of ending war on the theory that it is better to sacrifice justice than risk a European conflagration. Wilson is furious. Canada is only one of many nations reluctant to punish Italy, but she had hoped King would set an example. Instead, he has helped deliver a message of appeasement. The Palliser Triangle was on its way to becoming the Great Canadian Desert. It was the longest siege of atrocious weather since, in all probability, the times of Joseph in Egypt.
Dust and debt have covered the prairies for nearly a decade and changed the political landscape of the West. James Gray finally finds a job at a newspaper and sets out to report on the progress of Canada's new leaders. William Eberhardt broke the spell of the do-nothing school of political sorcerers by insisting on trying to do something, anything. But Bible Bill Eberhardt has not yet made good on his promise to give Albertans a monthly handout. He asks Ottawa for a loan. But King believes propping up the provinces could impoverish the federal government. Eberhardt decides to go it alone, printing his own money and regulating the banks himself. It is against the laws of Canada, but Eberhardt is answering to a higher authority. The spirit of Christ has gripped me. I am only seeking to feed, clothe, and shelter starving people. If that is what you call a dictator, then I am one. James Gray tells Eberhardt he seems to have taken a page from Mussolini. Eberhardt is not flattered. He was biting, discourteous, and captious, and what began as an interview ended in a shouting match. He could be an arrogant boor. Eberhardt hates the press. He calls reporters rats, liars, sons of Satan, and fornicators, and then passes the accurate news and information law, which allows him to censor the media. Mackenzie King uses his federal authority to stop Eberhardt's legislation, but he does little to solve Alberta's economic woes. Just a province away, James Gray finds another political party emerging from the dust, another legacy of Ottawa's perceived neglect. In Saskatchewan, the handy alternative was the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. If something had to be done, they were prepared to make the sacrifices that were needed to make it happen. This is Canada's first socialist party. The founding members include 26 construction workers, 15 farmers, 6 teachers, a miner, a motion picture operator, the poet Frank Scott, and Canada's only Labour MP, J.S. Woodsworth. A severe condemnation still rests upon indifference. We have tried to provide for the poor, yet have we tried to alter the social conditions that lead to poverty? To many, a socialist party is a terrifying idea. The mayor of Vancouver sees it as proof that Stalin has entered Canada through the back door. If you elect those people, they'll take away your home, they'll take away your car, and burn down your churches. Furthermore, they'll nationalize your women. They are revolutionary. The new party will take its demands for socialized banking and universal health care all the way to Parliament. Frank Scott finds it one of the most exhilarating moments of his life. I shall not forget the denunciations of capitalism hour after hour and the raging thunderous applause afterwards. In 1935, five CCF MPs are elected to Parliament. King largely ignores them. Frank Scott is appalled. His most famous poem is dedicated to King. We had no shape because he never took sides, and no sides because he never took shape. He skillfully avoided what was wrong without saying what was right, and never let his one hand know 
what his, on the other hand, was doing. It is 1936, and 5,000 miles from Canada, there is a fascist insurrection in Spain. General Francisco Franco wages civil war against the government. The legally elected Republicans are backed by the Soviets. Germany and Italy provide arms for Franco. Norman Bethune, a surgeon and a socialist, is one of the few Canadians who sees the fight for what it is. The world war has started. It's democracy against fascism. It is in Spain that the real issues of our time are going to be fought out. It is there that democracy will survive or die. But Bethune is equally consumed by love. Marion Scott is a painter. She is married to the poet and CCF founding member, Frank Scott. The Scots have an open marriage. It is another way for the bohemian couple to challenge convention. But like many of the decade's experiments, it comes at a price. This pain because F is with another woman. Use this pain, this special pain. Use this pain that wrenches me to new planes. Norman Bethune offers solace to Marion Scott. You are the first woman in the world I've met, about whom I felt no doubt that we could live together physically, mentally, and spiritually mated. But Marion Scott will not leave her husband. Bethune is heartbroken. He leaves for Spain, where he will use his medical expertise to save thousands of lives. Ronald Liversedge, a veteran of the On to Ottawa trek, is one of many Canadians inspired by Bethune. I read a press report of how this doctor, Norman Bethune, had raised funds for and organised and taken to Spain the first mobile blood transfusion unit to be used in warfare. I knew then that I had to go also. Canada is officially neutral in Spain's war. But Mackenzie King still fears the foreign conflict could divide the country. He signs into law the Foreign Enlistment Act, forbidding Canadians to join the fighters in Spain. We believed our duty was to keep Canada united and avoid controversies or discussions liable to create trouble abroad. Now that it is illegal to go to Spain, Liversedge will have to travel on a badly disguised passenger ship, a favorite target for fascist torpedoes.
the ship seemed to literally leap from the water. All around the ship was a mass of floating wreckage. Barrels, crates, cases, planking, canvas, wooden bedsteads, and amongst all this debris were bobbing heads and floating bodies. I came up behind a man who was hanging onto the end of a wooden bed. As I approached him, I said, how are you making out? Not so good. Good Lord, are you here too? He was Ellis Fromberg from Vancouver. As Liversedge swims through the wreckage, he recognizes more old friends. Seventeen hundred Canadians are headed for Spain. The majority are veterans of the On to Ottawa trek. Having lost many battles at home, they are ready to fight the war for democracy abroad. People try to solve the riddle of the Depression in a hundred different ways. The new Premier of Quebec, Maurice Duplessis, believes one answer lies in a return to the countryside. The government must recognize in its legislation that the province of Quebec has always been and must always be essentially agricultural. Back to the land movements are already popular across the country when Duplessis takes office in 1936. During the 1930s in Quebec, 50,000 people flee urban unemployment and head north to farm the stingy soil of the province's rocky shield. Duplessis is most popular in rural areas and he starts pulling money out of the urban centers. Irene Duhamel is a teenager living in St. Hyacinth, Quebec a city that voted against Duplessis and is now five million dollars poorer. One day a colonization agent came to the house and offered us land. In Abitibi. For sure we wanted land. Just not in Abitibi. The 18-year-old has been robbed of an education by the Depression, but she continues learning with her church youth group. It was a way of channeling my energy. It taught me there was life beyond Saint-Hyacinthe. Duhamel organizes a field trip to Quebec City to demand the new premier offer the same subsidies to education as he has for colonization. I was very impressed. I was so proud of being there. He called us my dear, dear children. But in any event, the meeting didn't last long. Maybe a few minutes. Duplessis listened kindly and then he said in a definitive tone, No. And then he added for the workers, 
Their salvation will be in heaven. Duplassi's grip on his province is becoming tighter. And saxophone player Myron Sutton is suddenly out of a job. Duplessis sent two guys down to Rockheads, and that's when Rockheads was going great. And they told Rockhead they were his new partners. And Rockhead said, no way, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, they took his license. Rufus Rockhead is an enemy of Duplessis and the owner of a popular nightclub. The licenses of Negroes, Jews, and Chinese were canceled at the same time. Whoosh. Just like that. 1937 brings in the Padlock Law, the notorious bill that allows the Quebec government to shut down newspapers, labor groups, and religious organizations. The provincial legislation contravenes the laws of Canada, and Duplessis knows it. But if Mackenzie King censures Duplessis, he might upset Quebec and the delicate balance he has worked so hard to maintain. So he does nothing. Five thousand miles away, Ronald Liversedge and the Canadians in Spain have their own unit, the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion, or Mac Paps, and by 1937, they are being crushed. Four months of stubborn retreat without let-up against an enemy whose superiority in weapons rated over us ten to one. We were all changed. Even facial expressions seemed to be nursing unwelcome thoughts. Half the Canadians who go to Spain die in the field. The survivors swear they will fight to the end, but the end is nearer than they know. Hitler and Stalin have signed a secret deal. The Soviets will sacrifice Spain. The Mac Paps are sent home. Left alone on the sidewalk, across from the CPR depot, the place where I'd started my journey into Spain from a little under two years ago. I thought, well, Ron, home from the wars, but with no home to go to. Fascists ruling Spain, Italy, and Germany, democratic leaders now fear world war. Hitler is advancing, and no one knows where he will stop. are more concerned at the prospect of war than Mackenzie King. I wondered whether I would have the strength to continue at the head of a government or whether the government would last any time 
as it was certain that Canada would immediately become a divided dominion. King travels to Berlin. His mission, to convince Hitler to cease his military aggression. The Nazis put on a display of fascist splendor. King tells Hitler that Canada will stand at Britain's side in the event of war. But privately, King is very taken with Hitler, as he records in his diary. He smiled very pleasantly, and indeed had more of a sort of appealing and affectionate look. His face is much more prepossessing than his picture would give the impression of. It is not that of a fiery, overstrained nature, but a calm, passive man, deeply and thoughtfully in earnest. His skin is smooth. His face did not present lines of fatigue or weariness. His eyes impressed me most of all. There was a liquid quality about them which indicated keen perception and profound sympathy. King is not alone. After meeting the Fuhrer, a top-ranking British diplomat compares him to Mahatma Gandhi. American ambassador Joseph Kennedy calls Hitler a man you can trust. In 1938, Hitler unveils the face of Nazism for all the world to see. He orders an all-out attack on Jews in Germany. Kristallnacht, called Kristallnight because of the thousands of panes of broken glass from Jewish homes and businesses that litter Germany's streets. Senator Karine Wilson is one of the few non-Jews lobbying for the refugees. Two weeks after Kristallnacht, she calls a meeting with the Prime Minister. The growing intensity of the persecutions and sufferings of thousands of these unhappy people constitutes a great challenge to the reality of our humanitarianism. Our loyalty to our democratic principles makes it imperative that we render what help we can in this urgent situation. King shunts her over to the real architect of immigration policy, a bureaucrat named Frederick Blair. Blair is extremely proud of his record. Canada has allowed in fewer Jewish refugees than any other Commonwealth country. I often think that it would be far better if we told them more frankly why many of them are unpopular. If they would divest themselves of certain of their habits, I'm sure they could be just as popular in Canada as our Scandinavians.
Word is getting out that Wilson is one of the last hopes for refugees trying to get into Canada. Her desk is flooded with letters. The Stein family of Vienna writes to their cousins in Montreal that their business has been shut down and they are forbidden to earn a living. They are homeless, stateless, and penniless. Particularly affected are the two children, a nine-year-old boy and a seven-year-old girl. Our distress increases daily, and there is nothing left for us but suicide. Our only hope for survival is admission to Canada. The Steins are rejected. Wilson now believes Blair's bigotry is standing between life and death. But Blair is unmoved by her pleas. All the complaints Mrs. Wilson brings to me are about Jews. Jews make any kind of promise to get the door open, but never cease their agitation until they get the whole lot. Wilson feels she has no choice but to lower her sights. She begs King to force Blair to let in 1,000 refugees. Wilson is unaware that Blair is not her only obstacle. She has no idea that Mackenzie King has bought all the land around Kingsmere, his country house, so that no Jew can move near him. Nor does she know his real views about refugees, a secret he shares with his diary. We must seek to keep this part of the continent free from unrest and from too great an intermixture of foreign strains of blood. Finally, Wilson settles on a proposal that King agrees to approve. 100 Jewish orphans. But Blair invents more hurdles, and in the end, only two of the children make it to Canada. The Ottawa Journal calls Corrine Wilson the mother of lost causes. Canada will go on to have one of the worst records of Jewish refugee resettlement in the world. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. King receives reports from the great beyond that there is nothing to worry about. In a seance, his father tells him, Hitler has been shot by a Pole. At the same moment King is communing with the spirits, Britain is declaring war against Germany. One week later, Canada, too, declares war. Most people, including Prime Minister Mackenzie King, believe Canada's role can be limited, and King promises he won't impose conscription for overseas fighting. I held to the language that Britain was at war, and if attacked, we should take means of defence, and should not go beyond the defense of Canada at present. A limited war seems possible in the autumn of 1939, a period called the Phony War because fighting has come to a temporary halt. For now, enlistment remains voluntary, and French and English alike begin to sign up. In 
In St. Hyacinth, Quebec, there are five fewer mouths to feed at the Duhamel table. Irene Duhamel's brothers are all soldiers now. She is about to begin her adult life as the wife of Georges Graveline, a handsome Montrealer who woos her with books. But once again, her life is altered when the phone rings. He called and I feared it was because he was going to join the army. I said, but we're supposed to marry. The damn fool said, do you understand that it's a job? It's deliverance? The phony war comes to an abrupt and terrifying end on May 10th, 1940. King realizes his dreams of a limited war have ended too. Fellow Canadians, the brutal domination of Holland, the tragic invasion of Belgium, the surrender of France, the capture of the Channel ports, has happened in such quick succession that the world has hardly had time to breathe. One crisis has not passed before another has arisen in its place. Peril has been heaped upon peril. Who will say on what new horizon destruction may not loom tomorrow? Five days in May of 1940, the outlook is dire. Germany controls most of Europe, and many believe that if Britain puts down her guns, Hitler will spare her. King and Britain's new leader do not like one another. King complains about Winston Churchill's habit of drinking champagne in the war room. Churchill refers to Canada's prime minister as the little son of a bitch. But they will be forced into a history-making alliance. Churchill is facing tremendous pressure to surrender. Even U.S. President Roosevelt feels Britain might have to capitulate. Roosevelt calls his friend Mackenzie King and asks him to pass on the message to Churchill. King admires Roosevelt, but he despises Roosevelt's message. It seems that the United States was seeking to save itself at the expense of Britain, that the British might have to go down. I instinctively revolted against such a thought. My reaction was that I would rather die. King feels he has no choice but to relay the message. He is galvanized by Churchill's response. We shall never surrender. And if this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. Churchill carries the day. There will no longer be any talk of surrender, nor will there be any question of Canada's role. 
With France under occupation and the Americans still on the sidelines, Canada is now Britain's leading ally. Only a few months before, King had tried to limit Canada's commitment. But now he orders a national registration for home defense. Ronald Liversedge is now too old to go to war. At 40, he gets his first job in a decade, building warships in Vancouver's boatyards. Dr. Norman Bethune, Canada's most vocal anti-fascist, won't be enlisting either. He is in China taking care of Mao's troops. He dies there in 1939, a hero to millions of Chinese. James Gray is prepared to leave his family and a job he loves and join the troops. But when he goes to enlist, the doctor recognizes him from the Dole lines. He said, Jimmy Gray, what the hell are you doing in this man's army at your age with your TB history? Get the hell out of here and don't come back. Over the next year, 200,000 Canadians will volunteer to fight in Europe. The Prime Minister commands factories to begin 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week production of war supplies. Canada is finally back to work. The Depression has been ended, not by any far-reaching economic policy, but by a European dictator. Irene Duhamel goes to the train station to say goodbye to Georges Graveline. She is one of a million women who have no idea if they will ever again see their loved ones. Keep smiling through. And Irene Duhamel knows that if he does return, her fiancé will be a different man, coming home to a different country. Don't you work like other men do? How can I work when there's no work to do? Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah, give us a hand out to revive us again. Just out of jail I ain't got no money It all went for bail Hallelujah, I'm a bum Hallelujah, bum again Hallelujah, give us a hand out To revive us again I went to a house I 
asked for some bread. The lady said, "Scram, bum, the baker, he's dead." Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah, give us a hand out to revive us again. Mm-hmm.